So let's get started. Uh, I'm the one who, who starts um, the workshop as it will take roughly two hours, one hour for ACTEL and one hour for uh, RSP. Thank you very much for joining in and thank you to ETN as well for uh, helping us host this, uh, this workshop. So I'll be starting with ACTEL. My name is Hugo, some of you already know me. Um, and the purpose of ACTEL is to allow us to make standardized analysis of acoustic uh, telemetry data. So this is an introduction uh, and I'll be starting by the very basics. Um, usually what we have is a bunch of data and what we would really like to have is results. And the question is, how do we get from one to the other? And usually we are faced with uh, different types of problems. For example, how do we apply the same rules for each fish? How do we account for uh, variability in the study area? How do we detect and remove erroneous data? And you know, also very importantly, how do we make analysis, uh, the analysis reproducible? But before we can actually tackle these problems, there's something more central that we need to address. And that is how exactly do we pack the data that we have obtained? And to answer this question, we have to ask ourselves, what exactly makes a study? And we can essentially break it into three pieces. We have a study area or a map, we have a bunch of tagged animals, and then we have receivers. Let's start by looking at the map. The map is essentially a bunch of points, uh, uh, coordinates, and some represent release sites, and some uh, represent places where we deployed receivers. And these are called stations. They can either be release stations or hydroform stations. And the hydroform stations can then be grouped into arrays, which in turn can be grouped into something even bigger, which are the sections. And we can uh, transfer this information into our computer in the form of a table, which we'll be calling spatial.csv. And we have columns like uh, station name, the type, if it is a hydroform or a release site. Then we have the array to which the station belongs. There's a, a special case for uh, the release sites where this is actually the first array where we expect our fish to be detected. And then we have the section with uh, information on which section does our array belong to. For the case of the release sites, we just leave it empty because it, this information will not be used. And you can have other columns. You can have uh, geographic coordinates, some annotations on, on, on the particular points, things like that. But it essentially sorts our map. We can, we can put our map into a single table. Then we go into our tagged animals. And the tagged animals have different kinds of information in them. There's biological information, things like the origin of the fish or the animal, uh, the length, if we took any samples. Um, then we also have tag information. We have the code space, we have the signal, you may have interest on in knowing the manufacturer, the value of life, things like that. And finally, we have uh, release site information, which is both the location where we release the fish, but also the time when the fish was released. And again, we can transfer this into a table, which we'll be calling biometrics.csv. Um, and in this table, we have the signal of the tag. We can also have the code space of the tag. We have the release date, the release site, and then we have other columns that might be relevant for our study. We might have different groups. We might have recorded um, specific biometric measurements, you know, or other kinds of stuff. The only important thing to keep in mind here is that the release site should match the name of uh, release station in the spatial.csv file. But that means that we can essentially uh, sort the information for our fish also in a single table. And then we have our receivers. Now the receivers obviously have a serial number and then they also have deployment information, you know, where and when did we actually deploy these receivers to a specific station in our map. And finally, of course, we also have the offloaded files with the detections. Excuse me. Um, we can put most of the information regarding the receivers in a single table as well that we'll be calling deployments.csv. It has the receivable serial number, the station where the receiver was deployed, and then the start and stop times of the deployment period. And you can have multiple receivers deployed in the same station or the same receiver deployed in different stations over time. That's all fine. And again, the station name must, must match a name that is in the spatial.csv file. 
then we are left with the actual offloads. The best thing is to just put them into a detections folder. And unless you know your well around Excel, do not open them at all, uh, because Excel is very prone to destroying the formatting of these files, and then Actel won't be able to read them. So that means that with three tables and one folder, we are essentially able to condense the information from our study. And this is where Actel comes in. It will grab this data that we packed together and it will turn it into results and fancy graphics that we can later on use. Now, of course, things are always a bit more uh, complicated, but you know, if you, this graphic is from the, the, the paper um, of Actel, which you should have access to, but you can see here in the center, there are our mandatory uh, files and folder, and then we can feed these files into the main analysis. I'll open the floor uh, quickly just for one or two questions if anyone has some doubts because we have too many people today uh, to be able to answer everything. Is everything making sense so far? Up till now. That's good. Um, in that case, I will then move on to the first R exercise and this is where things will get a little bit uh, weekly with this uh, share system. So I'll share my script for a moment just to show you what I'm going to run. So I'll be running lines one to line uh, 58 down here, just so you have an idea of where I am. And now I'm gonna switch the share into R so that you can actually see what's going on. You won't be able to see the script at the same time. I know it's not great, but sadly, it's what we have to work with today. Uh, I hope you can follow me. I'll, I'll be mentioning script lines as I go. Uh, the first part of the script, of course, will run the first line because that's an important one, actually loading the package. Um, and then you have some information in lines three to 18 about how you can find more information about uh, Actel. I won't be running those lines here because that's stuff for you to check later. Then we have the first uh, exercise, which is the example di data exercise. And let me just, I, I forgot to bring one more uh, slide in, sorry, let me just change my share so you can see. So we'll be using the Actel uh, example data set. And this is the data set that we will be working on. This is a study that was made in Denmark and we have Atlantic salmon smolts that were released at the red flag and then they were expected to migrate towards the sea. One important thing is that array A0 is actually outside of the migration path. So we would expect to have no detections on this um, particular array. Okay, back to R. It's gonna be a lot of back and forth for me today. <laughs> so on line 24 of the script, um, this just tells you where you are working. And it's usually a good idea to be working on the same um, on, on the same folder where you have your Actel uh, data, the one that you downloaded through GitHub. So I'm just going to change my uh, um, work directory. You can change yours too uh, into that particular folder. If you're running R Studio and you opened the script directly through R Studio, I believe it will automatically uh, open it in the right uh, folder. If not, then you have to change it. Maybe we have some people experienced in R uh, in, in the chat and in the, maybe maybe they can help. Maybe John Pai as well can give you a hand if something's going wrong. Sorry, John, for putting you in the spotlight. <laughs> um, in the meantime, I'll continue. On line 28, we'll be running a function called example workspace. And this is deploying that data set that I mentioned uh, just before. And you can see it gives us some information. Uh, it created a new folder called Actel example. And in this new folder, and I will change my share again, just to show you this part. There we go. Uh, you should be able to see my folder now. Uh, so you can see a new folder was created here. And it has the files that uh, I was just talking about, and there's the example information inside them. So 
I'll go back into R. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to move into that newly created folder. So set WD actual example. And then I'm going to run this line uh, that was presented to me. Uh, the only difference between this and what's in your script in line 43 is that I've changed the name of the object. So let's get this one up and running. And we'll get some messages here. This is normal. Uh, Actel is very chatty. And the objective is to give you a chance to make sure that things are making sense. So it says that we have uh, 60 target tags. And you can see uh, one of our uh, automatic listening stations has no detections. And we can see which receiver it is. This is not something that's bad per se. And in this particular case, this is the receiver that was deployed at a zero. So this is perfectly fine. However, Actel does let us know just to make sure we didn't forget to put some offload files or something like that in our analysis. Hey, Hugo. And then we can see. Sorry. Um, in the chat, we're just getting a, a request for you to increase the size of the font if you can, just a little bit in your uh, R session. Hmm. That's a good question. So, what happens if I do something like this? Does it get bigger? That is, I think, perfect. Okay, perfect. That works. Uh, <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, where was I? Okay, so then it uh, compiled our uh, detections. It created movement events. We'll look into that. It made some uh, quality checks. Of course, this is the example data, so everything goes very smoothly. Usually that's not the case. So the analysis is able to go on. And now it is asking us if we want to save a copy of our results into this particular file. And I recommend you to always say yes to this question, especially when you are running report equals true. Because if I say yes, now my results have been saved. And if even if something crashes while Actel is compiling the report, you, have, we will, you will not have missed all of your results. Because you know R is a bit like this. Either everything works perfectly and you get everything in the end, or if something fails somewhere, then you lose the whole thing. And this question, this break here is precisely to allow you to save your results and make sure that you won't lose all of your analysis if uh, something fails during the report. Is everything making sense? I'll take the silence as a yes. So one thing that I can show you um, is that if I go back to my folder here, uh, you saw that the analysis was still running in R, but this file was created. See, this is the results of our analysis. So even if something failed or, you know, if, I don't know, for some reason your computer lost power or something, your results are already saved. And when you come back to your computer, you can just load them back in uh, into R. And we'll go quickly through that as well. So let's go back to this screen with R. All right, um, producing the report, drawing the detection graphics, uh, sensor values for the data as well, saving the actual report as a HTML file and the process finished successfully. So that's our analysis done again. This is the example data, so things go very quickly. <laughs> uh, but if we go back to our folder, we can see that now there's an Actel Explore report.html. And I'll quickly go through it uh, with you just to highlight some of the features. Here we have it uh, already open. We have a little summary in the beginning of the things that um, represent our study area. Uh, this Initial part might look might look redundant to you because this is the same. This is essentially part of your spatial file, and then you have your deployments file. It seems like it's not doing anything here right now. But if you have to come back to this analysis in like half a year, uh, you'll probably be very thankful for having all of this information ready in one in one place. Then we have uh, the warnings highlighted. You can see we only have the warning about no detections, and then uh, some, <clears throat> some other warnings that are not very relevant for now. 
We didn't include any user comments during the analysis. Then we have biometrics, uh, biometric graphics. This is a nice little perk of Actel. If your biometrics file has any column that has the keywords length, mass, or weight in them, then Actel will automatically grab those values for you and it will plot it by uh, the groups of fish that you have. This is mainly intended for you to quickly check if something is looking wrong in your biometrics. You know, if you recorded centimeters rather than millimeters, or you know, if one of the measures, one of the measures, sorry, is not making a lot of sense. Then we get some uh, detailed information. This is the actual results. I won't go into all of these in uh, high detail just because we don't have the time, but those were arrival times at different uh, arrays. And now we also have the individual detection plots uh, that show the detections for each of our fish. And again, this is a migration. So we expect this sort of behavior where our fish are slowly going through our stations. And then we have, so this index here is clickable. So you can click on it to go to different sections. And if our tags have sensor data, then Actel will plot them as well. This is fake sensor data. I created it just for the example. So that's why they all look the same. But it still gives you a good idea of the kind of information that you get. And at the very bottom, this is one of the key pieces of Actel. This is a log of everything that happened during your analysis, including messages, warnings, your decisions, and all that. So you can see here uh, the interventions that you made with R while the analysis was going. In our particular case, we just said yes to saving the results. But if you have a more uh, troublesome analysis, if you will, then everything will be here. And when you come back later on, you can quickly check why did you decide to do this and that based on your decisions. And finally, we have a carbon copy of the function call. Of course, I only set up the TZ argument, but all of these other arguments also exist in the back. They just you know, they were all with the default values, so we don't need to change them for, for anything. But this particular piece is also very relevant when you want to figure out why something is not looking the same way as it was looking before. Maybe there's an argument that has uh, been set in a different way. Uh, okay, so that's about it for this one. I'll change back to R and just check my script. Okay, and now quickly, uh, I'll go through lines 48 to, to 56 of, um, of the script. And this is, so if any of you has had any problem with the report, so the report failed, therefore the function failed and you didn't get your results, you can use this function called data to list and you feed it the, uh, sorry, yeah, you, you can see my script now. Let me just change to my script here. So you can use the function called data to list, and then you give it the name of the R data file where your results are saved. So if I run this line, this object will look exactly the same as if it had come from uh, the explore analysis. If any of you is having problems with even getting this particular object, then I have included some pre-compiled results uh, in the folder as well so that you can keep up with the rest of the course without you know, not really having a chance to see what's going on. Um, do we have any questions? It has to be very quick, but... I'll assume things are working or that at least people are being able to get their uh, doubts short sorted in the chat. And I will keep going. So now that we've seen a bit of what um, Actel uh, gave us, we'll understand a bit of what is happening under the hood. So we have our detections, for example, here. And what Actel does is it starts by splitting these detections by a, a transmitter so that then it can work with one transmitter at a time. And for the transmitters, what it does is it's going to condense these detections into what we call movement events. And these movement events are made, you know, it's a very straightforward format. For all of the detections, it will ask, is the following detection on the same array? 
And is it within one hour uh, interval? This one hour can be changed with the argument max uh, interval. And it will go through our detections. And whenever one of these questions fails, it will start a new event, right? And then it keeps going, new event, and so forth. And then we'll create what we call the movements table, which has the movement events. And you can see here n equals three because it corresponds to these three detections on this side. And then once the movement events are created, it will run a series of movement quality checks. Uh, we have the five basic ones here, which is the minimum detections, jumping arrays, impassables, speed, and inactiveness. So after it has run all of these checks, we get what we call the valid movements. Excuse me. And migration and residency have some more checks, but we won't really go into those because we don't have time here, sorry. The first one is the minimum detections. It's pretty straightforward. Essentially, if your tag only has one movement event and that movement event has n detections or less, which is set by the argument minimum detections, then the tag is discarded. Now, one thing that's important is that this does not apply if your tag has multiple movement events. So even if you say minimum detections equals three, and your tag has two movement events with one detection each, then this failsafe doesn't apply anymore. And the reason for this is that it is somewhat unlikely that you will get an error code twice in different places or in different times, right? That's what will create different movement events. So if that happens, then it's better to not do anything to that tag by default and leave it to you to check if something, if that's making sense or if that is really some sort of noise. Then we have jumping uh, arrays. If all of your arrays work nicely, then the jump size is zero. Otherwise, as things get worse and worse, then essentially the jump size is bigger. And you can set the arguments jump warning and jump error. Jump warning defaults to two, jump error defaults to three. So in this particular case, if the jump size is two, you will get a warning saying that the fish is jumping uh, arrays. And if the jump size is three, you will get that warning. And on top of that, the movement table will be shown to you so that you can decide if there's any movement events that need to be invalidated or if you know it's just your arrays that didn't perform as good as we would have hoped. Then we have impassables. Um, impassables require a special file that we'll talk into uh, in just a second. But essentially what the impassables check is doing is it is verifying if your fish didn't make any movements that you said is impossible. So we have these two examples here uh, where the fish can move between A and C both ways, but there's a barrier here and the fish can move from B to C, but not from C to B. Now, in this particular study area, if the fish had been detected on C and then on B, Actel would assume that array A had failed, right? Because that was the only way that the fish could have gotten from one to the other. However, in case number two, um, there's a barrier here also. So the fish can move from A to C, but not the other way around. So in this situation, if there's any fish that was detected on C, and then on one of these, uh, you will get an error and you will have to either invalidate some movements because this does not represent your fish, or you will have to go back and change this file because after all, it seems like your fish can actually move uh, across these, um, these barriers. Then we have speeds. Again, you know, if your fish is moving too fast, you'll essentially get a warning or an error. Uh, the, the speed warning and speed error have to be set manually, and they also require a special file, which is a distances.csv file, and we'll get into that later. Then there's two speed methods, uh, last to first, which is the default, but there's also last to last. So as you mentioned, the fish was released here. If you have last to first, then you'll have a separate measure of speed to uh, array A, which is this time, then you'll have a speed in A, which is this time. However, if you have the method as last to last, then the speed to A will uh, encompass all of the detections on A, 
then the speed to B will be from the last detection on A to the last detection on B and so forth. So it depends on how you like to analyze your speed, essentially. Then finally, we have the inactiveness. The inactiveness check works on the tail of the movement events. So after the point where your fish stopped moving between arrays, then Actel will check the difference between the first time and the last time. That will be matched to the values of these arguments, which again, you have to set yourself manually. The reason why there isn't a default for this is that this depends a lot with your study species. So, you know, it's, it's better if you set these up yourself. Uh, and this works better with the distances CSV file because then Actel can check the distances between the stations that actually detected the fish. And if they are less than 1.5 kilometers apart, then Actel assumes there's a valid case for inactiveness. Otherwise, it assumes that your fish must be actually moving to be detected in all of these uh, stations. Okay. So before we go into questions, uh, we'll just quickly check some of the things that I was just talking about. Let me just change my screen share again uh, into R. And then I'll let you know I'll be running lines uh, uh, 60 to 70. So let's see what is inside the output of our uh, results. We have lots of different uh, objects. Some of them we already know from um, our input, like the spatial, the deployments, the biometrics, but there's also some new stuff like the movements, uh, the detections, valid movements, valid detections, etc. So we can check what is inside the valid movements by asking for its names. And we can see that there is an object inside of valid movements for each of our tags. And we'll go and check. So Valid movements is a list of tables with one table for each of our tags. So if I run line 67, I'm essentially saying I want to see specifically the table for tag 4451. So I'm going to open it up. I'll, I'll, have, I'll try to just make this a little bit bigger. I hope that's OK. Just so everything fits in one. I'll move it back once I'm done with this part. So here we have an example of a movement table with our array, the section to which the array uh, belongs, or array, sorry, the number of detections, first station, last station, et cetera, et cetera, um, for this particular fish. And the only difference between the valid movements and the movements, which was another object that we saw uh, up here. So you see we have movements and valid movements. The valid movements only show the movements that we said these movements are really valid. They represent true movements of my fish, while as the movements would have include all the stuff that we said was not valid. Again, this is the example data set. So for this particular case, they are exactly the same, right? But for other study areas uh, and other data, they won't be the same. And then we can also have a quick check at the valid detections uh, for the same fish. And we can see we have all of the information for our particular fish. And this is what RSP that we'll be talking about later. This is what RSP will be grabbing from the actual output or you know, the main piece that it will be grabbing from the actual output is these valid detections so that it can then do its own, its own magic. Okay. There has been a lot of information. I hope people are still uh, keeping up. Are there any questions or doubts that I can quickly answer? There's a good one in the chat here, Hugo, from uh, Helga Bjork. And let me see if I can reach the chat. Uh, I'll read it to everyone. How does the speed check deal with the uncertainty in the position of the fish in relation to the receiver? Does it not check for receivers that are too close? Right now, um, that's one of the things that I would like to work on. Um, so for reference, I'm no longer working with telemetry, which means my time for Actel is limited. But to answer your question, right now, Actel will only grab the points of the receivers 
and it will measure the distance between them. And the logic between that is that your fish is as likely to be, you know, for most cases, your fish is as likely to be on one side of the receiver as it is to be on the other side. And this applies for both. So on average, the speed would be the time between the mean points of the receivers, if that's making sense. One thing that I would like to do in the future will be to add a column with the error associated to the receiver so that Actel will then give you a average speed you know, from the exact points of the receivers, but then also with an error estimate based on the detection range of the receivers themselves. Uh, in terms of the receivers being too close, um, that's one of the things about how we structure our study area. And that's in the vignettes. I can, if I, if I remember to do it, I can put it in the, in the chat too while Yuri is doing this part. One of the things that you shouldn't do is you shouldn't uh, put receivers that are within detection range of each other. These receivers should not be on different arrays. So the speed calculations, they are made on the movement events, which only happen, so you only have a break in movement events if the fish moved to another array or if it was away for too, for too long. So you will only get a new speed movement from one array to the next. And if your arrays are well spaced, then this problem of the uncertainty between the receivers sort of fades out, you know, compared to the whole distance. But if they are too close together, then yes, that is something that will lead into problems. And right now, there still isn't much that Actel can do about it, but it's something that I plan for the future. I hope that answers the question. Okay, uh, any more questions regarding the movement checks? Then I'll keep on. So what do we have next? Next we have, I'll talk to you about a bit, uh, a bit about, sorry, the optional files. And the first one is the spatial.txt file. And the reason why we need this one is because not all of our study areas come in the same shape. It would be great if they did, but sadly that's not what happens. And the question that we are trying to answer, <coughs> sorry, with our spatial.txt is, where can my animal be detected next? Now we have some study areas that are nice and simple where our receivers, our array, sorry, come one after the other. And when this happen, happens, sorry, Actel can answer this question automatically for us. You know, if the fish was detected on B, then it can either be detected on A or on C. That's, that's about it, right? However, if a fish was detected on B here, then it's a bit more complicated. So when this happens, then we need to give some help to act on. So it is essentially a question, oh, sorry, I, I skipped some animations here. You can see some fancy graphics. <laughs> uh, so it is essentially a question of whether our study area is linear, in which case Actel can, in the background, create a spatial.txt file for us and we'll never see it, or if it is non-linear, and then we have to create one ourselves. And the spatial.txt works in a very straightforward way. We'll essentially just link our arrays uh, together. So if for this particular study area, this is what our spatial.txt would look like. So we would have A, dash dash b which means that a and b are connected then dash dash c dash dash d etc uh, and that would be sufficient to um, exhaust all the possible connections between arrays for this study area however on this one things get a bit more complex so we say a connects to b which then connects to c and then to d and then we go through another line, A connects to E, which connects to D, etc. Now, it's the same thing to say A connects to B and then to C, and saying A connects to B, and then on a new line saying B connects to C. See, it's just, we can uh, abbreviate the, 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 the structure a little bit so it's easier for us to write, and it's also faster. But essentially, this particular, a set of connections would exhaust all the possible uh, connections between arrays in this study area. 
things get a bit more complex for the migration because then uh, A connects to B also means that the ray, the fish is expected to be detected on A before it is detected on B. But we won't go uh, too much into that again because of time. Again, you can always send me a message um, if you're running into trouble. Now, it is also on the spatial.txt file that we'll be able to set up our impassable. So if instead of saying A, I'll, I'll go straight to this one. If instead of saying B dash dash C, I say B arrow, if you will, C, then I'm saying that the fish can move from B to C, but it cannot move the other way around. So for this particular data uh, set of arrays, this would be the uh, spatial.csv file. So A connects to B both ways, A connects to C both ways, and then the connection between B and C is a one-way connection. In this particular case, the only difference is that the connection between A and C is also a one-way connection. And then until when it reads this file, we'll realize that there's no way the fish can move from C back to A and B, which will then trigger the impassable um, the movement check that we were talking about just earlier. The other optional file is the distances.csv. Uh, this one is a bit complex. Uh, it is essentially a matrix of the distances between each spatial point. It has to be, it has to obey a certain structure. So there's some functions that I've created to help us uh, making this particular distances matrix. And we'll be uh, doing an exercise on it. So the first thing you need is a shape file of your study area. Uh, and you have to take care that it has to be in the same coordinate system as the coordinates that you set for your stations in your spatial.csv file. So the table that we spoke about in the beginning. And then we have a pipeline of functions. We have the shape file, we add to it the spatial CSV, we run load shape. That gives us a water raster. We'll be using a neat function from, plot, from RSP to check if things are looking okay. Then we feed our raster into a transition, into the function transition layer. A transition layer is an object that R can use to actually calculate the distances. So then we use this distance layer, uh, sorry, this transition layer together with the spatial table. We feed it into distances matrix and voila we get a distances matrix in the end. And we'll be seeing this all working uh, right now. Let me just switch around. I'll go first to the script so you can see where we are. This would be line 76 all the way to line 110. <clears throat> so I'll change now uh, to my R session again. I suppose the font size is still looking okay. If not, please shout out so I know. And the first thing I'll run is line uh, 79, which essentially loads our spatial file alone without being in an analysis. We can have a quick look here. One thing that was added was this standard name column. This is made automatically by Hacktail. It is an essential column, but you don't need to worry about it. And you can see we actually have two sets of coordinates here. One is in WGS84 and the other is in the metric system. So we'll be using the one in the metric system for, for these calculations. Sorry, just drinking some water there. Um, so now I will run line 95. Now, the thing about line 95 is that's the one that's going to grab our shape file. So we need to give the name of the shape file in the shape argument. And if the shapefile is not in our current work directory, which again, we can check by running this. If it is not here, then we need to specify, specify the path for it. In my particular case, I know my shapefile is in this folder. So you can see that in the path, I just set two dots, which is shorthand to move one folder up. So R will know to interpret this as a command to just grab it in the parent folder of the one where we are working. Then we need to give it the size of our shapefile. We can provide the spatial. If we omit this argument, then this function will actually know to look for a spatial.csv file in our folder as well. So we can do it both ways. 
and we need to tell it uh, the coordinate systems of our, sorry, the coordinate columns of our um, spatial .csv file. So this can take a little bit of time. Uh, the pixel size is set in the same unit as your coordinate system. So if you are using a metric coordinate system, that means 10 meters. If you are using a system like WGS84, that would mean 10 degrees, which would be huge. So you have to pay attention to your coordinate system. If you're not very used to GIS, then maybe ask a colleague for some help here uh, to make sure that things work. And the pixel size, it has to be something that gives you enough resolution, but at the same time doesn't crash your computer. So it's a bit of a fine tuning experience there. Um, until you get exactly what you need. While this one's running, is anyone having troubles? Is everything making sense? Let's have something in the chat. Okay, I, I would have assumed that they would have loaded on their own, Carly, but sorry about that. But I'm glad you managed to get it to work. Uh, these things get very complicated between operating systems and our versions, whether you're using RStudio or not. So it's, it's always, it's just so much variation, but I'm glad it worked in the end. We'll add that to the list of packages that need to be. So G systems and R All right, in the meantime, uh, we have finished loading our the shape file, I'll run this function from RSP. If you're not used to this notation, this essentially means I want this function from this particular package. And what this means is that I don't need to actually load RSP through library RSP to be able to access this, this function. So that's a, a neat trick um, if, if you just want to grab one specific function from a package. Now I'll need to change my share so you can see. And here we have our shape file, and we have also our dots where our stations are. And RSP is very nice to us, and it also checks automatically whether our stations are on water, on our or our, sorry, or on land. And if any of the stations are on land, then you have to go and fix it because otherwise the whole thing will eventually fail. That's a very important take-home message. So make sure that everything is working fine. Um, even the load shape function, if you provide it with the spatial columns, so X and Y, if any station is found to be outside of the water, um, load shape will also complain. So you have multiple times where you can check if things are going all right. Then we just create the transition layer based on our raster. This is a really straightforward time. It's just you know uh, transforming an image into something that R can use to calculate distances. There really isn't a lot of science to it, at least, you know, from our part. So you just have to wait a little bit here. These things always take some time. Always make sure to assign the output of the function into an object because otherwise you'll be waiting and in the end you won't get anything out of it because act, uh, sorry, because R will just output the output, if you will, the results in the console. We can take these minutes to ask more questions if you have some questions you'd like to ask. I hope that means everything is working for everyone. <laughs> okay, our transition layer is ready. Oh, let me just check the chat. Uh, Yuri, can you give uh, Ina help with downloading the RSP package, please? And I'll keep on going in the meantime, if you don't mind. So now that we have our transition layer, uh, we can calculate our distances matrix. As it stands right now, the distances matrix function knows to, to go and check for a spatial .csv file in your current work environment. We can see from the help here, there's actually a way to make it work with a spatial file that was already loaded. But that's a bit more complex, so I won't cover that here. Um, if you want to know more about that, just give me a shout and I'll tell you how that works. So I'll just run this. Uh, it is 
automatically creating an actual compatible um, distances matrix, which also means when it is done, it will ask us if we want to save the output. And here it is. Would you like to save the distance matrix as distances.csv in the current work directory? I'm going to say yes, so I don't have to worry about it anymore. But we can open it just to ooh, my, my clipboard just did something weird there. I'll just do it like that. OK, so here is our distances matrix with all of our stations, all of our release sites, and the distances in meters between all of our stations. Now, there's also a manual way to do these calculations that is explained in the package vignettes, which I can quickly bring up just so you can see it on the fly as well. So I've run browse vignettes uh, actel that opens a, a page in my Chrome, which I'll share with you now. And you can see this is the manual for actel and 1.2 is creating a distances matrix. So then you click on HTML. You have an index here, so you can switch between multiple pages. And this will also explain to you how you can make a distances matrix in the manual way, a way that does not involve shape files and core bits and, and stuff like that. So just bring that information out there for you as well. Is everything making sense? Uh, so let me just say one more thing. Uh, you. One, one thing that you will have to calculate to work with RSP is the transition layer. So an RSP does not depend on a distances matrix, but it does depend on a transition layer. So you will be using load shape and transition layer when you are working with Yuri as well. And with that, some quick time for one question if anyone has it. Otherwise, uh, I'm nearing the end of the presentation. Let me just share my script again. Um, where were we? We were here. You can try running the, migra the migration and residency analysis on the um, example data set as well. I'll get that running in the background. And another interesting thing that you can do, if, if you have been working on a particular analysis and you have been typing your answers as you go in the console, then one thing that you can do is you can copy paste the whole block of code into R and R will know to feed these into the correct lines. We'll see that in just a second. Let me just get the migration analysis running here just so I can quickly show you how the migration report looks like. So if, you, if I change my share to my uh, R, you will see that it's actually now running the <coughs> the migration analysis. In this particular case, just because this is an example, I'll say I don't want to save the results. Again, I recommend you to always save your results in case something goes wrong with producing the report. And while that is going, I will skip a little bit here on my PowerPoint. So the last thing I want to tell, to tell you about is post analysis function. And you know that's what allows you to create fancy plots. And that's, as we all know, that's a very important part of any R package is that you have to be able to create fancy plots. Uh, and there's detailed information in the manual about how to get every plot that you saw in the report standalone in R. So even if your report function is not working, you can still get all of the graphics in R using this manual. And you can access to this uh, particular page of the manual by running this line, or you can just go to the manual itself, and then it will be, just go to the top here, it will be beyond the three main analysis. So the very last page of the manual. And here you have a second index that you can use to learn a little bit more about how to plot stuff. I won't have time to run these uh, during our course here because of time uh, constraints, but you should be able to get the information you need from, from the manual. And you can also run that question mark and the name of the function to access the help file of the functions themselves. That's also very relevant. So you can see at the very bottom of the script here, we have the, the that line that takes you to that page of the manual. 
So what I was telling here, just coming back to this point, is that if you try to copy paste all of these uh, lines into R, change my chair again, uh, R will know to put the answers in their right places. So, and we'll see that happen here on the fly. And this is very relevant. So you can you see there, comments went into the right place. This is a lovely fish went into a new comment for this tag. And would you like to render any movement event? Sorry, any movement event invalid? That's a no. Would you like to save a copy? That's a yes. So I've managed to run an entire analysis just from running that block of code as a single piece. And why is this very relevant? This is very relevant because if your analysis crashes, you will be prompted with a message saying that you can recover a log, including your user decisions, running the function recover log. And what that means is that you can then go into that log, extract your user decisions, which are at the bottom, paste them into your R script and run your analysis again. And that means you don't have to go through everything uh, manually again. Of course, if you change something in the input data, then I would recommend that you go through it manually again, of course, because things might have changed. But if it's just, you know, you, you ran out of power on, our, on your computer or you have to go home for some reason or, or change locations and you have to shut down the computer, you can crash the analysis on purpose by pressing the stop button on R Studio or by pressing escape, escape on regular R. That will prompt the recover log function. You can then recover your log and um, continue running your analysis later on by just copying exactly the same uh, user decisions. Now I'm just going to let this one finish and then I'm going to crash an analysis on purpose just so you can see what I'm talking about. But before we go into that, I'll make a new share of my Chrome windows again. So here we have the new reports. So this was the very first report for the exploratory analysis. Now we have a migration analysis you'll see that the index has changed. So there's now things like section survival, uh, places where the fish were last seen. There's also efficiency somewhere. There we are, the array efficiency. There's more information on your fish. Did it succeed? Did it fail? Also in your reports, you always have these tool tips that also guide you to the functions that allow you to replicate these graphics. And we can see now this is a migration function. Um, and I actually did some more user interventions this time. And then if Zoom allows me to reach, there we go. Uh, now we have, for example, the residency analysis. And again, some changes here. We also have array efficiency, but it was calculated with a different method. You can see more about it in the vignettes. So here, uh, where is it? one-way efficiency estimations and then multi-way efficiency estimations. And in our residency report, we also have stuff like uh, global residency. So where were our fish over time in relation to our sections? Now, this is an important distinction. All of these big results, if you will, like where did my fish disappear? Where was it? Did it succeed or where did, yeah, I already said that one, where did it disappear? All of these will appear by section. So it's one level up in relation to your arrays. And then you can always change these things by going back into your spatial table and rearranging how your arrays and sections look like. And one thing that Actel will do for the residency analysis is if your fish spend a lot of time between a last detection in one section and the first detection on the next, then Actel will create this sort of middle section uh, and tell you some of your fish for this particular day spend most of their time between one location and the other. You have it in absolutes, you have it in percentages, you have it individually for each fish. This is a very nice way to see if some fish are doing uh, migration patterns. 
uh, within your study area. All of these plots have the same X uh, range so that you can quickly compare uh, the behavior of different fish. And then you still have the usual, your detections, your sensor data and, and all that. So now the last thing that I believe I wanted to show you is I will, uh, am, I sh am I sharing my R uh, window? I think I am. So I'll run this analysis again, but I will purposely crash the analysis before it has time to finish. I'll just give it some time to reach these uh, comments, uh, sorry, these user interactions that we, we had just a moment ago. Okay, so I'm gonna crash this. I just crashed it. Um, and before it finished, so at this point in time, I pressed the escape key and it told me the analysis errored. You can recover the latest job log, including your comments and decisions by running recover log. So that's something that I'm actually going to try to do. Uh, if I run it like this, it will complain. I need to give it a name. So what I'll do here is I'll say, uh, crashed analysis and it is telling me that it saved a job log for a residency analysis that was run on this particular time and it saved it into this uh, file. So if I now go into my folder, which is here, uh, we'll see that there's a crashed analysis.txt file and I'm gonna open it and I'm gonna share that window now. And this is the crashed analysis.txt. It tells us everything up to the point where some exception occurred. In this case, it was me purposely destroying our analysis. And it tells you what comments you left behind before the analysis failed. And again, here we have the, the user intervention. So I could copy these and go back in here and paste them here. And if I ran the whole block, I would go back to the point where the analysis crashed. Now this, is, this recover log can be very useful as well if something seems to be a bug and you need to talk to me about something that's going on um, with your analysis. Now, I think that was about everything uh, that I wanted to, to share with you. Let me go back to my uh, PowerPoint. So yeah, um, some time for any final questions before uh, Yuri takes over. And uh, that's about it from my uh, introduction to Acto. Did everything make sense or at least some things? <laughs> Let me check the chat as well in case we have some, some there's one from Barbara there about um, how to change from using sections to using arrays. That might be good to go go to. So uh, thank you, John. Uh, one thing that you can do, if you want to do that, Actel will always be looking for the sections, but nothing stops you from making the sections column exactly the same as the array column. And then what will happen is that each array will also be its own section, right? So you're tricking Actel into doing you an by array analysis. It just thinks it's the section anyway. Does that work? Oh, sorry, does that answer your question? That's what I meant to say. <laughs> okay, perfect. Is there any more questions that I can answer? So here goes, someone was having problems uh, exporting the report, I think. Okay, uh, the report is always a tricky thing because it requires Pandoc and I can see some people already having some issues with it. Uh, the first thing that I would recommend is that you try installing the latest version of Pandoc mm -hmm. If, if it's struggling with your version of R, then I would honestly recommend that you update your R uh, version as well. It's always nice to have the latest stuff uh, running. 
unless you're going into some really deep analysis and you're afraid that something is going to crash um, if you change the version. If you're still running into problems, then we can look into it personally. Just shoot me an email and I can try to solve it with you. Uh, I can also see Ashley has some problem with the, uh, the, the 24 hour uh, plot. Could not save SVG graphic. That means that something in your R or in your computer is not connecting properly in terms of letting R know where the SVG engine, so the things that actually create the SVG graphic, um, Actel is not being, uh, sorry, R is not being able to connect with it. We would have to uh, try, is, is that a Mac computer? Could be, I remember some issues on Macs uh, with it. Uh, you could try running the plot circular function. You'll go into the last um, page of the manual and see the plot circular function. See if you can actually run those because that one will not try to save the file, the, the graphic into a file right away. So you might be able to uh, get the graphic anyway and then just save it in another format. Uh, otherwise, we'll probably have to look into causing a crash rather than a fail safe because the crash will tell us exactly what failed. So in, in, in Actel, I made a fail safe if something goes wrong instead of crashing the whole thing, you just get that graphic, but that also doesn't tell us why it was going to crash. So if you want, you can shoot me an email and we can look into that um, after the, the workshop. I hope that helps. Um, oh yeah, it's a Mac, I see. <laughs> yeah, the Macs can be a bit uh, temperamental on how they behave with, with things. So if there's no further questions, at least right now, uh, Yuri, I think I'll give you the floor. Thanks, Hugo. Let me just share this here. Um, so I guess I'll just use our studio for today. <laughs> Yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> After a while, it's kind of <laughs> kind of natural. So instead of switching windows with uh, going into yeah. the menu bar or something, you go into Zoom, and then that actually once you change the share, the window comes up automatically. So it, it works. It's a bit complicated in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's see how it goes. <laughs> uh, all right, uh, hello everyone. Thanks for joining us today. So let's dig into RSP now. Thanks, Hugo, for introducing us to Actel. Um, so RSP uh, and Actel are yeah, like very sibling packages in a way that for you, we just want to make sure we only using the most um, reliable detections for RSP. So that's a, a good option uh, to include Actel and filter those uh, raw data in the first place, okay? So just a little bit of uh, background on, on how RSP, uh, how the idea behind RSP started. So before, uh, most of the approaches to analyze acoustic telemetry data in the aquatic environment, they would draw, uh, uh, look at the movements of the animals uh, as straight lines. And of course, in, in the open marine environment, that might not be a problem. But when we look at complex habitats like estuaries, getting a trajectory like the one shown uh, in the image might be a, a problem, right? Uh, and after you get those tracks in this way, like crossing through land, estimating uh, utilization distribution areas would also include a lot of land areas, which we might not be interested in. And these would actually uh, return unrealistic movements of our tracked animals. So the idea behind RSP was actually uh, fix this problem. And in turn, uh, RSP actually recreates the, the paths of the tracked animals just inside of the water. All right. And after recreating that, so it's like a, a, a two step uh, approach. So first is going to recreate those tracks only moving through water 
and then calculate the utilization distribution areas, also only including water habitats, okay? Uh, so uh, the workflow of RSP pretty much is, uh, so this workflow is from the paper. Uh, and in, on the first place, you need to use Actel and uh, run one of the main analysis from Actel. So either explore migration or residency on your raw acoustic detection data. And then after you get uh, your filter detections, uh, uh, if you want to call that, uh, that will be the input for all the RSP analysis, okay? So mo uh, basically we can divide all of these uh, functions into two main steps, okay? So the first one is calculating these shortest paths in water, and we're gonna use run RSP for that. And then we're going to calculate the utilization distribution areas, okay? So there's a lot of detail there on how to uh, customize your analysis, uh, depending on what animals you're tracking, depending on what environment you're working in. Okay, so pretty much uh, this would be like the two, the core of the package, the core of the analysis. Okay, and then we can calculate the overlaps, which is uh, an, an additional uh, step of uh, RSP and might only be applicable if you're uh, tracking different groups of animals, like different, uh, if you're interested in, in, in interspecific variation or interspecific, right? Different species or different groups of animals, for example, uh, captive being released in the wild versus uh, wi uh, wild animals uh, or something like that, okay? Okay, so RSP, uh, in RSP, uh, we calculate the, UDs, right, the utilization distributions, and we use dynamic Brownian bridge movement models for that. So basically there's two main type of analysis we do with RSP, uh, which is group or track level, okay? So group basically is at broader biological level. So for example, if you're tracking different animals from different species, right? So say you, you're tracking uh, like 20 animals, 10 from each species. So you have two groups, right? Group A and group B, species A and species B. Or you can do all the analysis at track level. So this plot, for example, uh, are representative of bull shark movements in Sydney Harbor. And that th those analysis were run at track level, okay? So they were, uh, track level means you're interested at the individual level, okay? So what that animal did and not what the species did, okay? All right, so other than that, we also have the RSP analysis, uh, both at, at group analysis or time slot analysis. And the main difference is that group analysis is going to be run for a, an entire time period. So let's say you track your animals for a year, but uh, you're interested on, on the, the, the seasonal movements, right? So you can run group analysis at every group of months, for example, and that's going to return the, 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 all the results at only a space level, okay? So over the course of those three months or six months or uh, whatever time frame you're looking at, uh, what was the space use of those animals? But it can also be set for time slot analysis. So time slot analysis in RSP means you're doing your analysis at very fine scale. So you can basically just break that year of, uh, of tracking, for example, in 12 hours or 24 hours uh, windows, and all the RSP analysis will be done in those time frames. okay? So it's very fine scale and returns uh, not only space used in space, but also in time. For example, if you're looking at the overlaps, so the overlaps will not only be the only, ex exclusively the areas where those animals used at the same time, but also when they were using those areas in time. Yeah, and then after we do that, we go to the overlaps part of the analysis, which we'll go into detail in a sec. Okay, so for today, we'll be looking at some acoustic telemetry data uh, from Lake Macquarie. So Lake Macquarie is an estuary in the coast of New South Wales, Australia. And this is what, uh, what our study area looks like. So these are the arrays uh, and the locations of our receivers, okay? And we'll be looking at the space use of two different groups uh, moving through uh, this study area, okay? 
So let me just share our studio for now. Um, here we go. How's the font size looking? Is it good? Maybe it's too small. And let me try and make it a little bit bigger. Is this font size okay? Yeah, that looks good for me. Awesome. Cool. So let's start loading the packages we need for the analysis. And uh, so as Hugo was saying, with Actel, uh, first time you, you run things like with real life data, <laughs> things are not just not nice and smooth as it <laughs> looks in the examples. But the good thing is you're going to, save all your answers to the interactive functions from Actel in your script. And after that is done, you can every time go back and just select the whole thing and that will be run all at once. So these are all answers for the invalidate movements that Actel found uh, for the Lake Macquarie data. And these are all the answers in the invalidated movements that I found. And by selecting all of that and running at once, Selectel is doing the, the trick and then it's going to save the, the object for us. And here it is, okay? So study.data is our Actel result for an explore analysis, okay? So as I said before, uh, RSP also works with the other two, okay? So both with migration and residency as well. Okay, so now that we have our Actel object, and we can just have a look at the spatial, right? Uh, so this is the, how the spatial looks like uh, for the Lake Macquarie. So we have a total of 23 receivers, right? This is just the first six of them. Um, cool. So now let's start importing the other things that we need for RSP. So we need the shape file of our study area. And in this example, we'll be using WGS84. Uh, so the size here is in latitude degrees, okay? So this is the pixel size. We're gonna be using, uh, uh, Hugo has shown this before, right? So this is just loading the shape file and converting that into a raster that will be used for all the RSP analysis, okay? And then after loading the shape file, we will be, so uh, an interesting thing here in load shape is the buffer argument. So when we calculate the space use, let me just run this because it takes a bit. So when we calculate the space use areas, the error of the location uh, of the, all the locations of the animals will be taken into account to calculate the uh, utilization distributions, okay? So when, when it takes a long time and, and the error is too big, it might, uh, it might happen that the, the space you use contour will hit the borders of your shape file. So the buffer argument, uh, what it does, it adds some empty space around your shape file so that the contours can go in, in, into there, okay? So when you're running the RSP, uh, the Brownian bridge models, uh, it might uh, happen that, that that's gonna crash at some point, but don't worry because RSP will let you know. Okay, so that will uh, RSP will let you know that your shape file is uh, not big enough, and that you should reload it using a higher, uh, uh, a bigger buffer. Okay. All right. So the transition layer by default is is sixteen. So that's the number of possible directions. Uh, uh, there's a kind of a, a some background uh, theory behind this. I won't go too much into detail because we just don't have the time. But for the examples today, I'll be using an eight direction transition layer uh, just to make uh, things move a little bit quicker. Okay, cool. So that's done. So now we have our uh, input from Actel, our spatial, uh, sorry, uh, the study.data object. We have our transition layer object and we have our shape file of our study area. So we are all good to uh, go for RSP. Okay. Cool, so the first step, as Hugo was saying, is to use plot raster to check that your uh, shape file is good enough for RSP. And by running plot uh, raster, we can see uh, for this case, we have 
all our 21 receivers in water, okay? And no receivers on land. So if there is any receivers on land, this is a very important step and it, it, it should be run like before you run anything from our speed, you should check that all your stations are in water. Otherwise you're gonna get like very weird behavior uh, from the RSP uh, uh, analysis, okay? Cool. The next thing is, is actually uh, an update from RSP. So now RSP can include the recaptures of uh, your tracked animals. And by doing that, you, the only thing you need to do is to provide a recaptures.csv object in your working directory. And this is what the recapture uh, uh, object looks need to look like, okay? So it has to have exactly these names. Uh, so, so someone was asking if the names uh, should be the same for uh, that Hugo was showing, and that's the same for RSP, okay? You need to make sure your .csv object is named recaptures and the name of your columns is exactly like this, okay? So uh, the first column would be just a, a time, a time, uh, uh, a time slot, right, uh, object. So when your animal was uh, recaptured and the, ta uh, the, the, the time as well. So this you should provide in your local time zone. Okay, just to make it easier, right? When you're out in the field, you're making notes. It's just easier to write down in, in, in local time. So you, uh, that's the time zone you should provide this, okay? Uh, next column is the signal of the, of the animal that was recaptured. Uh, the length of recapture, uh, the weight, and the important, the most important ones, right? So latitude and longitude. So where the animal was recaptured and whether the animal was returned or not. Okay, so true or false for that one. So here we have, uh, for the example, we have two recaptures of the same animal uh, in two different dates, right? On the 17th and on the 31st. Uh, it was, yeah, the same animal. And these were the locations where it was recaptured. And we can add them to an RSP plot using add recaptures function. So we just specify the signal. There's a whole bunch of customization plots, uh, uh, sorry, customization arguments. You can change the shape, the color, the fill uh, of, of your points, okay? Uh, so here we have, so the only difference from this plot to the next one is that these are the receiver stations and these are the recapture locations for that animal particular, okay? So the interesting thing about this is that those recapture locations will be accounted for when recreating the paths of the animals and not only the acoustic receiver locations, okay? Cool, so I was telling you that we can customize RSP to fit uh, different study animals, study areas, and different things that we're interested in using RSP for, right? And pretty much you have all those details here in the run RSP help uh, file. So there's a whole bunch of arguments here in run RSP. I'll just focus on the most important ones, okay? So the distance, uh, not distance, uh, the time step, and the mean and maximum time are one of the most important ones. And uh, I, I, I do believe they're going to depend on what animals you're tracking, okay? So the time step uh, is pretty much the time lapse between the points that are going to be added in a way that uh, the default is 10 minutes for the time step. And that means that if your consecutive acoustic detections uh, happen in a time in a time uh, in a time step that is shorter than ten minutes, RSP will do nothing. Okay, but uh, if that war uh, that happens in a, in a time interval that's longer than ten minutes, RSP will interpolate those positions. Okay, uh, the minimum time is the similar to time step, but for the detections that occur on the same receiver. Okay, so that's the minimum time when animals are detected on the same receiver that RSP needs to do something. Okay, and by default, it's also 10 minutes. And the maximum time is uh, the time that's going to break different RSP tracks. So we're gonna go into detail what an RSP track is in a second, okay? 
So let me just run RSP here so you have an idea of how it looks like. So it's pretty chatty, as Hugo was saying about Actel. So it tells you a whole bunch of stuff. I'll just stop it off. <laughs> okay, no worries. It's just classic. <laughs> classic one, isn't it? <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah. It's because it, you're using it, it your happens studio. to me. Yeah, you see, <laughs> that's why we don't use our studio. <laughs> Okay, let me just open this again. Yuri, let so, me take a chance just to um, ask yeah. some, some stuff. Uh, is the length and the weight column in the recaptures mandatory as well? No, they're not, they're not okay. mandatory. The only mandatory ones are the signal, uh, the time frame, of course, and the location. So latch and long. Okay. 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 So and all the others are, yeah. And if we don't have recaptures, then we just don't set the argument, right? I'm just reading some questions out loud. Yeah, no. So if you don't have recaptures, so by default, run RSP, uh, recaptures is set to false, okay? So if we look here, uh, so by default, recaptures equals to false. So run RSP will not look for an RS, uh, uh, recaptures.csv object, okay? So that's an addition. And if you have that, and if you're interested in including those additional locations in your analysis, okay? So by default, it's not mandatory, uh, but if you do have that data, it might be worth uh, including because it's pretty, uh, it's important. And it's uh, where the animals were observed during the tracking. And it's good because uh, as I was saying, it's going to increase the areas. So your space use areas will go beyond the receiver locations okay so in other words you're just adding <laughs> additional receivers to your to your uh, arrays right but yeah it's not mandatory you don't you don't not need recaptures.csv to run uh, the rsp analysis okay okay perfect so essentially if there's no recaptures you don't need to worry about the recaptures argument yeah. at all because the default is already false so you just don't set it yeah yeah correct thank you so there's no need to to worry about the recaptures it's just an addition if you do have that data okay so while that's rerunning so uh, uh another important thing guys about rsp is that uh the run RSP analysis is not that uh, computationally heavy. So for example, uh, I've run this uh, function with 10 years of tracking of approximately 200 animals and it worked fine. Like it didn't crash at all. It, it took, I think, three hours or something on my computer. But the Brownian bridge models, they're very computationally heavy. So it's uh, a good option to do that in parts. I'll show you uh, how just in a bit, but for the run RSP, you can just run that for your entire study uh, at once and it should work. Okay. Uh, so what I'll do here, because it takes some time, I'll just load uh, the output from run RSP here. And this is just how the biometrics, this is just the biometrics file. So we have an idea of what animals were, were, were tracked. So we have here the column group, we have A and B. So we have most animals from group B and we have a few from group A, right? We have some biological data on them, the release sites, the transmitters. Uh, and we, we also have, okay, we'll go there uh, in a bit. So let me just run this one. So the get distances function, uh, can be used to calculate the distances traveled during the entire tracking uh, uh, of your animals, okay? So that will be run separately for each group. You can specify which group to plot. And this is just, the first one here is exactly similar to a plot that is on the RSP paper. So this, uh, by default, this plot is going to compare the distances traveled only with RSP. Uh, sorry, only with the receiver locations and also with the RSP interpolations, okay? And we can note for some animals, the RSP is evidently longer than the receiver. And that's because uh, 
when you use only the receiver locations, those distances are calculated in straight lines. Whereas with the RSP uh, uh, interpolated positions, we get those uh, distances following the, the, the shape of your study area, which is going to return a longer distance just by that. Okay. So there is another argument in plot distances uh, that can be set. So compare equals false, we only return the RSP distances. Okay. So if you're interested in just looking at the RSP distances, you can just use that. And by selecting the group of animals you're interested, all animals will plot uh, at once. Okay. So that's for the distances traveled. So let's have a look at some of the R run RSP output. So this is all the information that is stored in the RSP uh, output, the, sorry, the run RSP. And the output is, is stored uh, individually as lists for each tracked animal. Okay, so if we have a look at the detections, so we can see that each transmitter is stored independently. Okay, and that's the same for the tracks object. So the tracks object will also be individually for each tracked animal. Okay. Uh, and what's the difference? So what's, what are those, uh, those objects? So the tracks object is just metadata on each run RSP, sorry, each RSP track. And as we were talking before, by default, each RSP track will be broken by uh, periods of 24 hours. So what, means, what that means is that when the animal is not detected for a period of 24 hours, and then it's detected again in your study area, uh, RSP is going to break uh, the, that and that will become a new track, okay? So for, the, for example here, uh, track one for that animal, uh, it started on the 11th and then it went to the 12th, so the next day. And then the animal was detected on the 13th at 9 a.m., okay? So that's longer than 24 hours, right? 24 hours would be five in the morning uh, on the 13th, but that it was on the, at 9, 9 a.m., not five. So RSP broke uh, th that block of detections into a new track. That is simply to uh, uh, reduce the uncertainty behind the possible locations where that animal might have been, right? So when the when the animal is not present in the study area for a period longer than a day, that will become a new track, okay? And the interpolations will be will start again, okay? Uh, so another example here. So the, from the 13th, it was detected consecutively until the 14th, and then it disappeared again, and it was again present in the study area on the 16th, and then it was detected just on the 16th, disappeared again, 18th, and so on, okay? So these blocks of, of, uh, uh, of consecutive detections in a period shorter than a day are assigned to specific tracks, okay? So those tracks will then be accounted for in the Brownian bridge models, okay? So it might happen that some of those tracks are actually invalid. So if we have a look at uh, line number 10, there is a false, right? So there is a column valid here, and this track number 10 is invalid. So if we have a look at that, so track 10, we have here original N, which is the number of acoustic detections, and new N is the number of RSP locations added, okay? And we can see that that was only a single detection. So that happened, so the, on, on track number nine, the animal was being detected on the eighth, and then detected all the way through the ninth, and then it disappeared at 2.56 in the morning, and then was detected again on, on the 10th, on the next day at five in the morning, it was detected only once and then wasn't detected only until the next day at 5.11 in the morning. So that means that that single detection over a, a long time period will not be included in the, in the Brownian bridge models, okay? So the Brownian bridge models, they're a little bit tricky and they need some quality control to make sure they're gonna work, okay? Uh, so this other example here for a different animal, all tracks are valid. We can see the difference here, right? So that the other, while the other animal was like being consecutively detected, disappeared, consecutively detected, disappeared. This one was consecutively in the study area for a period of eight days here from the 10th to the 18th, 
disappeared, came back on the 20th, and then from the 20th to the 27th, and then disappeared again 29th until the 9th, okay? And we have a column here for time span. We can see pretty large time span in hours for that animal, okay? Cool, so the track object from RunRSP just metadata on what happened and you can have like an idea of what the, the animal movements looked like. Uh, how about the detections? So detections is actually the, the, the locations and the interpolated positions of the animals, okay? So these first 11 rows uh, for this uh, particular tag here, if we look at the position column, we have receiver RSP, receiver RSP. So what that means is that receiver position means the, the actual acoustic detection, okay? And the RSP uh, position is a, an interpolated position. So if we look at the first one, so the first detection was on that particular receiver at 1025 and then at 1046, the animal was detected on the same receiver, okay? So this time interval between the first and the second detection is longer than the mean time, right, of 10 minutes. So what our RSP is doing here is, is adding additional positions to fill that gap. And in that particular example, what RSP does is because it was on the same receiver, it's going to repeat the latitude and longitude of the, the receiver station, okay, and just increase the error. So the error is played with. So as the animal moves away from the first detection, the error increases, and then the error decreases again as the animal approaches the second detection, okay? So in this case, uh, we only have the, so the time interval here was approximately 20 minutes, which just in, added two locations. So we can really see exactly how that looks, just increased by, 5% here, so from 500, 12, and then came back to 500 as the animal approaches the second detection, okay? But, and that same idea is gonna happen for when the animal is detected on different receivers, right? So if the animal moves from point A to point B, as the animal moves away from A, the error increases, and as it approaches B, the error decreases, just because there's a whole bunch of movements the animal could have performed and just to account for that uncertainty on estimating the positions, okay? So the second example is actually uh, something like that. So the second uh, detection was in this receiver and the third was on this other receiver here, okay? So a different one. And that happened between uh, a couple of minutes, right? Longer than 10 minutes again. So RSP will do something about that. And what it's doing is it's estimating positions, right? So different latitude and longitudes, which are exclusively inside of the water. And look at what is happening with the error, okay? So the error is going from 500, increasing to 525, and then decreasing back to 500 as the animal approaches the second detection, okay? And then the last couple of detections in this example are all in the same receiver, okay? So all receiver numbers here are the same. And we can see that they all happened in time intervals uh, shorter than 10 minutes. So that's why RSP did nothing about that and just included those as receiver positions in the detections object, okay? Cool, so this is how the detections object looks like. And we might be interested in plotting some of those tracks. And that's what plot tracks is for. So you just need to specify the tag that you're interested in, in plotting and the track number, okay? So for this guy here, track number four, so this is what the plot looks like. So going from one point to the next and track number four was, uh, so yeah, it's really tricky when you're, you're not using our studio anymore. So it's, it, it, this movement occurred between the 31st and the 2nd of June, right? 31st of May, 2nd of June, and 57 detections, the animal moved from there to there, okay? So this just plot tracks, but there is another function from RSV called add detections, okay? So add detections you can use to include the locations of your acoustic stations in the same plot, okay? 
So now we're plotting track number five, which is a bit longer, 107 hours. And that's how it looks like, okay? So now we can actually see the receiver stations and the movements of that animal during that track, okay? So where it moved from where to where, okay? And we can see that those tracks are all inside of the water, right? Cool, so plot tracks. So now let's have a look at how it looks when we have a recapture. So this is the animal that was recaptured. I'll recap not found because I didn't load that. Um, where's that? Here it is. So if we have a look at recaptures. Okay, so these are the recaptures, okay? So when you, you run, run RSP with recaptures equals true, what it's gonna do is every time, not only breaking the tracks by 24 hour intervals, but also when there is a recapture, uh, the track is going to start again on the recapture date and time, okay? So for example, for this guy here, the first recapture was on the 17th at this time. And if we have a look at track number three, that's uh, exactly the 17th and the exactly same time when the recapture occurred. So if we look at the previous tr uh, track, there was a single detection there on the 17th, right? Before the animal was recaptured. So that, uh, uh, that, that detection will be a, was assigned to track true. And that's actually an invalid detection because it's a single one. Okay, here it is. So uh, just have in mind that when you provide the recaptures uh, object, not only break, your tracks will be broken by 24 uh, periods or the max time argument, you can set that to whatever hour uh, uh, interval uh, you find uh, that's going to be applicable for your studied animals, okay? Uh, but not only that will be done, but also the recaptures will be accounted for to start new tracks, okay? Cool, and we can plot that using both add stations and add recaptures, and we can see where the animal moved from the recapture location. So that it is. So track number three, the animal was moving from the recapture point here, then was detected there. And it, that's the, the, the movement during track number three, okay? Uh, just another quick example here with the other recapture. So we have uh, track number six, which was the other recapture here at 6 p.m. So it's starting there and the movement of the, the animal up there, okay? And just a quick look at how the output looks like. So when you have the recaptures, you will not only have position RSP and receiver, but you also will end up having position recapture, okay? And we can see that track three, and then we have a recapture that will start track six, okay? So why going from track three to track six? That's because track four and five were invalid. So if we have a look again at the track metadata for this guy, so here it is, okay? Track four and five, single detections, and they don't end up on the detection uh, object you get from the run RSP output, okay? So they are excluded. Cool, so we have recreated the paths of the animals inside of the water now let's go and run uh, some Brownian bridge models on that. So while this is running, uh, as I was telling you before, uh, Brownian bridge models, they're very computationally heavy. So RSP has arguments in the application of those models that you can actually set time windows of interest. So in this example here, we're using start time and stop time to just get a slice of our acoustic data between the first and the 5th of November, okay? And what that's gonna do is, it's going to calculate the models for each groups independently, okay? Just during that time frame. okay? So here, have in mind that we're running a group analysis, okay? So all the outputs here, all the results are for the entire study area and between those five days, okay? So there is a whole bunch of things going on here. So it's telling you it's the, discarding the detections previous to your start and posterior to your stop time. It's preparing the data and that's the time taken. So calculates for group A, group B, and the results will be in your uh, uh, 
stored object, okay? So similar to the run RSP uh, uh, function, the Brownian bridge model function, we will also store uh, metadata on the valid tracks, okay? So the object valid tracks will have information on all the tracks that were used for the Brownian bridge models for that, uh, in this example here, this five uh, window, uh, okay? So here we have that in group A, so during those five days, we got one individual. So this tag from group A, and we have two tags from group B, okay? So we have here the number of valid detections used for the modeling, the first time, last time the animal were detected, each of them, okay? The time span of uh, each of those tracks, okay? So we had track number three for that guy, five and six for the other two from uh, group B. But what happens is that those uh, tracks, they occurred on the same time window of between the 1st and 5th of November, okay? And we can pl plot those models using plot contours function. Uh, again, we need to set the tag of interest uh, by def uh, it's not default. So Brownian bridge models, they run in metric coordinate system. So RSP is doing a whole bunch of transformation here behind the scenes. But when we use WGS84, uh, which is latch and long uh, coordinates, uh, RSP will plot that, will convert that back to WGS84 to plot you, your results in the same metric system that you provided, okay? So the plot contours, so this is the uh, Brownian bridge model for this guy over the course of that five days, okay? Uh, there is another option in plot contours. So there's a whole bunch of customization arguments that you can set, for example, here to change the color of the land mass and the color of the, the interval of the, of the contour levels of the Brownian bridge models, okay? So this is just an example with a different animal. So see, there is a different land color, a different color palette here for the for the Brownian bridge model. And by default, the, the, the contour levels are plotted as a, a categorical uh, scale with a categorical scale, but you can set that uh, scale type equals to continuous and that will plot uh, the Brownian bridge model as a continuous scale rather than a category, okay? You can also add here a title to your plot if you want. Um, so there it is. So I'm just calling that animal, whatever, and the space used now with a continuous scale uh, instead of a category, okay? Uh, the other thing is that all RSP plots are ggplot2 plots. So you can use ggplot2 functions uh, to add stuff or, or to customize your plot as well. So for example, we can use the function scale bar from DGSN to add a scale bar to our plots, right? So as Hugo was saying, fancy plots is an important part of the analysis and you, you want to have a, a, a good quality plots for your paper, right? So there it is. There's a plot with a scale bar there. Uh, it also, uh, might be the case that you want to specify. So by default, these are the levels that are plotted. Uh, you can also specify them using breaks, okay? So you can just set which, which levels you want to see. Uh, and of course, the color argument has to have the same length as the number of levels that you're interested in plotting, okay? So in this case, we will specify seven, seven, uh, uh, seven uh, levels to be plotted and we need seven uh, colors as well. So that will be returned in a sec. So there it is, all the seven contours there, scale bar. So I changed the, the, the title now to display just the start and end date. So you can just customize your plot uh, however you want, but it might be the case that you hated all the options. So no problem if you hated all of them, uh, all the, all the output, so all the raster files, they are saved in the Brownian bridge uh, uh, output, okay? So for example, uh, say this is an example of a track, so a track, a Brownian bridge model for this animal on that track, and, and it's stored in group.rasters object, okay? So if we have a look here, uh, total, and we 
have a look at the group rasters. So now that's separated by the different uh, group of animals you tracked. So group B, and now you're gonna have one for each, uh, each track that was modeled during that time uh, interval, okay? So this is how it looks like. And as I said, the CRS is in UTM because the Brownian bridge models, they run in that uh, coordinate system, okay? So if you want to do your own custom plots, have in mind that you need to convert that back to latch and long if you want. So just plotting uh, by default here with the raster package. So this is what the, the, the Brownian bridge model looks like, okay? So see the, the, the coordinates are in UTM, right? So you can reproject that back to uh, the latch and long CRS. Uh, so all this code here is just an example if people are interested in running custom plots and then plotting that uh, with uh, a custom like uh, ggplot2 if you want or base R or whatever you're interested in doing, okay? Uh, now, see the difference now we are plotting the same, exactly the same uh, raster, but now in Latin long. Uh, I'm going to plot that with ggplot. So ggplot needs uh, data frames to create the plots, okay? So I'm just converting the raster to a data frame using this function here. I'll just rename that so that it's easier to work with. I'll remove just the empty values. So we reduce the number of uh, lines in that data frame. And then I'll select only the Brownian bridge values lower than 99, okay? So lower than 99%. Uh, we also need the shape file, right? To plot the land mass. Uh, and now we can just run all of this to plot a custom plot using the output from run RSP, okay? So I won't go too much in detail in what's going on here. You can just have a look later. If you have any questions, you're always welcome to uh, contact me and we can have a chat about that, okay? So just have in mind that if you don't like the plot functions from RSP, you have access to those objects and you can create your own plots, okay? Cool, now that we have the Brownian bridge models, we can calculate the areas of space use. And those can be calculated both in a track or group level, as, as, as I said before, okay? So first, let's have a look at track level. So we use the get areas function to calculate the size of these areas of space use, okay? And this is what the object looks like. So the output is returned at each group level. We have the ID, so the, the, the transmitter, the track, in the size of the contour levels, okay? So by default, get areas works for the 50% contours, which is the area where the animal spent half of the tracking time, and the 95, okay, which is a broader area and is more representative of the entire movement of the animal. This is usually the, the levels that most of the, the work is done in the literature, but you might be interested in, in setting different uh, levels if you want. So you can do that by setting a breaks argument. Uh, now I'm calculating the areas at group level. So uh, that will combine all animals from a particular group and calculate the size of that areas at the group level, okay? And by setting the breaks here, I'm adding the 25% contour, okay? So now the output looks a little bit different. So the ID is not long, not anymore the transmitter and the track, but the group name, okay? So we have that group A used these uh, areas and group B used these areas for each percent, okay? So this is the actual, uh, the, these areas are, values are in squared meters, okay? And we can plot those areas. So we can use the function plot areas to plot the areas of space use at group level, okay? So when you have multiple animals, so in this example, we only have two animals in group B and one single animal in group A. But imagine if you have 10 animals. So instead of plotting each of those 10 Brownian bridge models uh, individually or doing uh, work yourself and coding that uh, to merge and combine all of that, RSP does that for you, okay? So this is similar to what we saw before for group A, was only one individual, right? But if we plot 
that for group B, that will actually combine the Brownian bridge models for, from both animals during those five uh, day period, okay? So, so there it is. Uh, don't worry too much about all these uh, warnings here about rasters. That's only because ggplot, uh, when it works with plotting rasters and, and, and there's like two geometries, right? There's a geometry raster and geometry tile. And it's kind of like, it, it, it wants like a very nice contour that goes like, is a single uh, 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 area. And that's not the case here, right? So we have these areas occurring at different, different places of the study area. So don't worry too much about these warnings here. Uh, and the, the important thing here that the plot is combined. So remember that one animal was staying here and the other animal was doing this. So the plot areas uh, output actually combines the movement of all animals from that group. Okay. All right, so now we can have a look at the overlaps between these guys. And we use the get overlaps function to calculate the overlaps, okay? So the important thing here is that get overlaps will only work when get areas was set to group, okay? So that only calculates overlaps between groups of animals. So if, if you're interested in looking at overlaps, uh, you need to make sure you run get areas with group type, okay? Cool, so that's done and we can have a look at those areas. So they're stored individually for each level. So the same levels uh, that we calculated the areas for with get areas, uh, they will be used to calculate uh, the amounts of overlap in each of them, okay? So we have the overlaps here for the 25% contour between A and B in absolute. So the amount of in squared meters, but also in percentages. So the percentage is pretty much the, the percentage that the small area was contained inside of the larger area, okay? Um, here, th these are matrix, okay? Because we only have two groups of animals in this example, but if you have five, 10, so that all the overlaps between all of those groups will be run, uh, 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 will be calculated with get overlaps and returned as a bigger matrix here, okay? So this is 25, this is the overlap at the 50%. So if we have a look at the percentage, this is a very small percentage, right? Three point something. And now it has increased to 45% and the 95 will be 90.41%. That's simply because those areas are larger and they're overlapping more just because of their size. Because this is group B, right? And this is group A, right? So they, they indeed occurred in the same area. And because the, the, the sizes are getting bigger, so the, 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 the amount of their overlap is increasing this example, okay? And we can use a, func a function called plot overlaps to have a look at where the overlaps occurred. So again, you need to specify which level you're interested, okay? So this is going to plot uh, both the 50% contours for group A, the 50% contours for group B, and where the overlap occurred, okay? Uh, the other important thing is that you need to set the groups. So uh, as I was saying, if you have five groups of tracked animals, you, you can only look at these overlaps in pairs, okay? So you need to specify group A and C, a and D and so on, and then B and C and B and D and so on, okay? So the overlaps, the plot overlaps only works in pairs, okay? But we can have a pretty good look of where the overlap occurred, right? Uh, sorry, I'm not sure you guys can see the, the zoom window, right? But yeah, so here is, uh, so the 50% contours from B, 50% from A, and this pink area here where the two of them overlapped, okay? 
All right, so this was a group analysis, but as I said, we can also run that as a time slot analysis. So a time slot analysis is, in this example here, I'll use the same uh, time window uh, between the first, the first and the fifth, but the, the analysis will be run in time frames of 24 hours. So that means that the Brownio bridge models will be run in groups of 24 hours. So instead of having just one Brownian bridge model, we are going to break those uh, four days into windows of one uh, day, right? So 24 hours. So the time frame here is in hours, all right? Uh, so the main difference here is when we look at the overlaps, for example, these overlaps will not only be in space, right? So these, these, these example here from the previous analysis, this is the overlapping space, but we don't know exactly whether these guys were there on the same day, right? Or on the same uh, window, because you, you might be interested in doing, for example, 12, 12 hour time frame, which is half a day, right? Uh, I wouldn't go to fine detail on the time frames just because Imagine if you look at hourly time frames, for example, you might end up just analyzing, just using interpolated locations for the models. And that's not ideal, right? Because in a real world, you're interested in, in including detections because the detections are the real locations where the animals were, right? Not the RSP interpolations. So you going to find detail in the time frame might be tricky on that. So I wouldn't go deeper than 12 hour time frame, to be honest, but that will depend on your array and, and on the species you're tracking, okay? Cool, so that's finished. And now we also get a metadata on the time slots. So now instead of having an analysis for a period of four days, we actually have results individually for slots one to four which start at midnight on the first and end just before midnight on that same day, okay? So midnight start at second day and so on, okay? So all your outputs now will be broken by slots, okay? And those slots are 24 hours long because they were set here as the time frame. okay? So if we have a look at the valid tracks now, uh, we can just see here straight away that the time spans are all less than 24 hours, okay? Because when it, it reaches 24 hours, it's gonna break and start again, right? So ideally, you, this has to be like that. So if you see something that is not like that, please let me know because there is a bug there. <laughs> but uh, that shouldn't be the case. Uh, so here we have a new column in the metadata object that is called slot. And the slot now identifies the time slots, all right? So that guy from group A that was detected uh, over the course of those four days, uh, those uh, Brownian bridge models were run independently for each time slot, so for each different day, okay? Uh, we can see that in group B, we have uh, one guy just one, two, and three, and the other one, one, two, three, and four which is already giving us some additional information that we did, we missed with the previous analysis, right? That this guy here was only detected on the first three days and not in the fourth day, okay? Cool, so we get also the first uh, and the last time objects. Again, just metadata on what happened. And now I'm just gonna run all of these here at once. And what this is doing now is I'm using plot contours to have a look at the movements of this guy here, right? But over the course of the four days. But now that I, I have run a time slot analysis, I need to tell plot contours which time slot I'm interested in looking at. In this case here, time slot one, and then time slot two, time slot three, and time slot four. So the result of these plots here will start telling us a story of what this guy did over the course of those four days, okay? I'll just make this window bigger. Hopefully our studio will not crash. Fingers crossed. 
to be tense here. Come on. Maybe I should share the Zoom window. Yuri, can you give us an idea of how long you will still take just for the people that are needing to leave? Yeah, just maybe another 15, 20 minutes, I think. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so here it is. It's not great, but <laughs> sorry guys for the bad quality. But yeah, so that starts telling us uh, a story, right? So the first, second, third, and fourth in the movements of that guy going from one place to another. So the time, the time slot, the time frame uh, uh, analysis is a bit more detailed. Uh, but again, that means that uh, it will require some more time to run and some more memory of your computer as well. So keep these things in mind when you when you start, you know, preparing to do your analysis. Okay, so similar to the group analysis, all the rasters, they are saved and they are stored in the output. They are available, okay, if you want to do custom analysis on them. Um, and now when we get the areas of type group, they will also be separated by the time slots, okay? So this is the result of the size of space use areas for each time slot. Okay. And again, you have the metadata on the time slots uh, on your time slot object in the Brownian Bridge model output. Okay. So for example, here's just four days, but imagine you have like a month and a month into daily time frames. So that things start getting more complicated. So you can just match uh, those dates, uh, right? By the slot column here and the slot column in the metadata object. Uh, okay, cool. So now if we plot the space use areas from group A and from group B uh, for the time slot number one, we will actually have a look at where in space and time these guys were, okay? So hopefully... Off! Oh, <laughs> okay, now that's a problem. Yeah, I think we need to make sure next workshop we're able to not use our studio anymore. Yeah. Uh, damn. So, so. Let me see, how can I reload stuff here? Make this bit quicker. Um, probably just, yeah, I need a transition layer. Okay. Okay, so it's now loading the, the shape file again, and we'll also run the transition layer so that we can rerun the model. Yeah, I didn't have a problem running this on our studio before, but <laughs> it's yeah, probably it could be Zoom. because Zoom, yeah. Zoom yeah, Zoom is leaching up the memory. Yeah. I'm That's sure an important people, lesson. It's taking a bit longer. Yeah, sorry, guys. Uh, yeah. It's tricky. That's why I decided not to use our studio anymore. <laughs> no, but I mean, for, for those who have to leave, it's it's perfectly fine because there will be a recording. So you can always just see the, the last bit afterwards too. Yeah, I'll just repeat some stuff here about the overlaps and show an additional uh, function, which is to get data on, on the overlaps. But yeah, if you if you have to leave, you can always come back to the recording later. Yeah, so 
as I was saying, like uh, all the plot functions are ggplot. So if, if you want, for example, omit uh, legends, right? Like if you want to have a multi-panel plot for your paper, you can just omit that like with the guides uh, 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 functions from ggplot and all of that stuff. To rename your labels, you can use uh, the labs function, right? So all of those customization functions from ggplot, they work for all the plot functions from RSP, okay? And you can also have a look at that info, that info, that uh, workflow that I showed you on PowerPoint. It's available on the package or in the package paper. So you can always have a look at the paper and see uh, what plot, plot functions are available and what can you use them for, okay? Oh, I have to load the... Then we'll need to run the areas. Yeah, so it is good. You can also specify transmitters of interest if you want. Okay, that's another option from the Brownian Bridge models to only run. Uh, analysis in a particular uh, group of animals, not only group of animals, but also group of uh, individual tags, if you want. There's also some quality checks being uh, performed here, uh, which are not being returned. Uh, again, this is example data, right? So things run more smooth. But if you have, for example, uh, invalid tracks and things that were not supposed to be there, so you, that's going to be returned here on the console while you're running. Okay? It's not something that you need to worry about. It's just RSP making sure it's only using the good quality data to return your areas of space use. Okay? Cool. So let me get the get areas for daily again. All right. So another update on RSP is that get centroid functions. So the get centroid functions is uh, when we have, where's that? Here. For example, group B, we have multiple animals, right? So we have two different tags moving uh, for group B. So you might be interested in getting a, a representative location of those areas. So the get centroid functions, what it does is it's going to return, so in this example here for group B, right, type group, level five, and group B, okay, and the UTM zone of your study area. Uh, so get centroids is returning a representative centroid latitude and longitude using all the contours for group B in each of the time slots, okay? So we can plot them with plot areas and add centroids, so for example, here, uh, you need to make sure the uh, time slot of both uh, functions is the same, right? Otherwise you will be plotting the centroid from a different time slot. Uh, so here it's gonna plot the, so here what we have is the space use areas of 50 and 95, right? So they, these two guys, one moving there, the other one moving here. And the centroid location is this blue dot here in the middle. So just a centroid. So this is for the 50% contour, okay? So you can set that for the 95. Again, make sure you're setting the, a level that was calculated in the get areas, right? Um, okay, so now let's get the areas. So similar to the, to the group analysis, you can get these areas for each track, okay? So it doesn't matter that it's a time slot analysis. So only by running a time slot analysis doesn't mean all your other analysis need to be at, at group level, okay? So you can run, uh, also calculate the areas at the individual level. So for example, if you're looking at interspecific variation and inter-individual variation, things like that. So this is the centroid 
So the same, the, the previous example was the centroids. Uh, where's that? It's up there. So these are the centroids when we use a, a group uh, type of analysis, right? But if you're using a track type of analysis, you also can get the centroids for each individual, okay? So you get here a group a column, a track that is going to specify which individual and which track, the level of course, and also centroid latitude and longitude, okay? So also represent, these are just representative locations of the movements because you might be interested where in the study area the animals are moving where to, right? And only the areas will not return you like location uh, 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 data, right? So this is a way, the get centroids function is a way of getting location data for that. So now we can have a look at the overlaps. And yeah, so now the overlaps, when we have a time slot analysis, they are returned both in space and time, which is very useful if you're looking, for example, predator prey interactions and any kind of interactions between groups of biological, uh, biological groups of animals, right? So in this case here, we're gonna see that at the 50% level, the percentage of overlap between these guys was 97%, which means they were in the same area and on the same time, okay, on that day. So this was time frame, uh, is lot, sorry, time slot number four, right, the, on the fourth. And yeah, as you, as you can see, the get, the get overlaps takes a bit longer when you run a time slot analysis, right? Because you have more uh, uh, Brownian bridge models to calculate that for. But there it is. Um, all right, so 50 and percentage, right? And so on the third, there was no overlap. So just zero. And then on the fourth, there was 97.14, right? And similar to what we had before, we can just plot that. But now every time you have a time slot analysis with uh, RSP, you need to specify the time slot for all the plot functions, okay? The plot functions are exactly the same. The arguments you use to customize your plot, change the land color and all of that stuff is exactly the same. But the difference is that you need to specify which time slot you're interested, okay? So there it is. So 97% of overlap, we can barely see group A, right? But group B, we can see there and here and the overlap occurred a lot there on that particular location where we saw before, right? The, that animal from group A remained there for those four days. Cool. And the last part of today's workshop is the get overlap data function. So this can be very useful when you're interested in looking at environmental influences uh, driving these overlaps between groups, okay? So what, what this does, it is going to return you is lot uh, in metadata on them, but also the absolute and percentage uh, of overlap between the groups of interest, right? Sorry, I didn't show you this, but this is an important part of the function. So you need to specify again, in pairs, right? So if you have more than two groups of animals, you need to specify all of them in pairs. So the pairs you're interested, you can extract that data, you can maybe add a column here and store everything together, okay? But this is how you pretty much convert those matrix into a, a time frame, uh, sorry, a data frame that you can do uh, uh, use for further analysis, okay? So I'll just extract here now for the 95%. So I've called that two different objects. I'll assign a column value called level and I'll merge them. So now we have 50 and 94% and the values, right? In each of them. If you have, for example, water temperature, salinity or whatever environmental data you have, you want to include that. You can just merge that by the start uh, dates of that object. And just a quick example here, the variation of that as a function of time, right? So the absolute overlap in squared meters, 50 and 95 over the course of the four days, right? So it decreased here on the third and then increased again. And you can plot that as the percentages as well. 
kind of overlap there, it just goes from zero to one, right? And that's it. Uh, sorry for if I took too long <laughs> and sorry for the crashes. Uh, and I'm open to any questions if you have any. There were some questions on the chat, and I think we tried to answer uh, as you were going. Um, I remember I said there was some stuff that we could ask Yuri at the end, but I don't really remember what. So if the people are still around and they want to take the floor, please feel free. Yeah, I have one question, Yuri. Um, yeah. So um, as you were talking about the recaptures, um, so in, in, yeah. in our study, we are releasing the um, recaptured fish that are captured by uh, fishermen at different locations at the same release site where we released them at first. So I, I was just wondering whether one could uh, incorporate that information um, as well and how that would look like. Um, yeah, so, so basically the latch and longs will be the same, right? But the time frame will be different. So you need to make sure you specify the date and the time. Uh, for example, you might not have that to the nearest second, which is not a problem. Uh, you can just set the hour. So you just get the data like when, when was the animal released and the hour that it was released. So you just provide that as a, a fixed hour. So for example, if it was released at 2 p.m., so you can just put the 14.00 for minutes, 00 for seconds, and the date, right? But the location will be all, all, all the same because you're releasing them on the same place, right? I know that that was my question, actually, because we are releasing them at a different location from where they were captured. So. Uh, oh, in a different location. Yeah, yeah. you just provide the location they were, they, were, they, were they were released. So that's that's what they what they input need to look like. Uh, maybe I can share my screen and. I think I think the point here is that um, who was the name? Sorry, um, the person that was asking they would like to include both the recapture location, if you will, and the re-release location. So we would need a new set of uh, columns. I think that would be the release lat and long and the release time. So the recapture time and the release time would be different. I think that was it. Exactly. Uh, I see what you mean. So it's that you recapture them somewhere and then you move them somewhere and you release them there, right? Exactly, yeah. And your tracks then would always continue from where, ex exactly from where you recaptured them. And, yeah. yeah. So I, I, at at the moment, I would include the the release site. Uh, yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah. We might need to adjust something there then, because that would be recapture. So another column, as Hugo was saying. Yeah, like type or something. That one is recapture and the other is release, right? Yeah, but for now, uh, Leander, I, I'll just include, if you want to have a go at the moment, I would just include the, the, the release location, okay? Otherwise, it might move from one position to the next, and that might actually create some bugs there. So I, I would just go for the release site. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, it might be an interesting thing to work in the future, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good suggestion, actually. I, I, I'll write it down and, and incorporate that in an update in the future. Thanks for suggesting. Um, we have a question, which is, so uh, the time slots, they split daily. I, I think I answered this one correctly, Yuri, but just back me up here. So if an animal occurs at 2358 and the other occurs the next day at like midnight past two minutes, they will be in splitted time slots. And Enrico is asking if there's a way to make the time slots 24 hours from the last detection. So I think that's going to be very hard to make. But that's how it does at the moment, isn't it? No, so this would be different fishes, uh, different fish, different tags. Because you have the time slots 
for one day, let's say day one. And then we do the dynamic Brownian bridge for all the fish that were detected on that day, right? Yeah. But then if a fish was detected two minutes into the next day, it's not incorporated into- Yeah, that's the, a different day. Yeah. And right now, I don't think there's a way to make it any flexible so that, I mean, it has to start on the beginning of the day and then at the end of the day. Of course, you can choose yeah. a different time step, right, Yuri? And you'll have yeah, some more time hours. slots. Yeah. yeah. For example, you can, you can go for time frames of uh, longer than 24 hours, maybe. So maybe 48 hours and yeah. then and then use 48 hours for the time frames as well for the Brownian bridge models. Yeah, so there will always it be, just, for, for Enrico, there will always be a cutoff period where you are risking that some fish will be split by a couple of minutes, but that's just a caveat of uh, the way how the analysis is done, I believe. Yeah, and again, uh, uh, this can be done for a whole bunch of animals. We, we, I think most of us, because we work on fish, we kind of have like fishy ideas, but yeah, like imagine like a crab moving. It's not going to be that, uh, that quick as a fish moving, right? So at, at least we tried our best to include these arguments in which you can actually set up your analysis and, and see how it goes. Like it's all about testing different time frames and time windows that and see how the results look like. So if you can have a look at the metadata information about the tracks and you always see they're valid or invalid, right? So if you have invalid tracks and you actually identify that be, that's because they're occurring just like a couple of minutes after the next, the, the last one, right? So you can just make your time frame a little bit longer or your maximum time a little bit longer as well. Right, so I think we can ju always just adjust things there to make sure we're analyzing the data the best way we should be doing. All right, we have a different question. Um, if you have overlapping detections between receivers at exactly uh, at exactly the same time, then correct me if I'm wrong, but RSP just grabs the first one that shows up and discards the second. It doesn't try to calculate any sort of in-between location. No. Yeah, you're right. And also it's gonna let you know. So on yeah. one, of, one of those messages during the calculations, it will show up and say, uh, any number of detections occurred <laughs> on the same receiver or on the same location or on the same time and were discarded. Okay, so no calculations are done and they pick the first one that, that occurred, okay? And if the detections are very close to each other, even if it's just a second, then RSP actually takes both uh, and it will use both detections for the calculation of, of the user distribution, uh, for, of the distribution area, sorry, if I remember correctly. And we don't think this is too much of a problem because RSP does not concern itself so much with distances covered, it's just the actual locations where the fish are. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, uh, we, we do have those distances functions, but they're not one of the main objectives of RSP. It's just like a way of having an idea of how much your animals moved. I wouldn't rely too much on those distances because uh, yeah, there is a whole bunch of other stuff going on, right? Like the detection ranges and stuff like that. But yeah, it's just a way of having an idea of how much the animals are moving and maybe identifying animals that were actually maybe dead or, or you know, doing something weird and excluding them, going back to Actel and removing them from the analysis. But yeah, I wouldn't rely too much on, on the distances for, with RSP. RSP is all about locations and areas of space use. Not that much about these distances. Okay, then we have uh, so somewhat of a question, more of a suggestion from, from Ashley. Ashley is working with active uh, tracking data. So obviously it's not something that fits into Actel. And also it is only active data. So, so there's no passive arrays or, or things like that. So it's, mm -hmm. it's data of a different uh, nature. I don't really see that it would easily fit into Actel and RSP as it is. But one thing that you might find interesting is work with Ashley for a new input method 
uh, to allow RSP to work directly on active telemetry data. I don't know how your time is and availability for coding stuff, but uh, just know that there's some interest there in terms of active telemetry. Yeah, we, so when we were developing RSP, it actually was one of our ideas, right? So we were yeah. uh, actually we were actually interested in in including some active tracking data into RSP, so we could uh, somehow analyze that with the package as well. But just because of time and, and, and I think we actually try to contact people, right? But uh, it didn't work on the uh, uh, then. But yeah, it's definitely something worth looking at. And if you're interested, we can probably have a look at that. Probably not in the next six months. Because <laughs> I'm finishing Sorry, my Ashley. PhD. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, I, like, I'm finishing my PhD and I need to do some writing. <laughs> but right, yeah, definitely. maybe it's definitely something worth doing in the future. Yeah, because one thing that we discussed in the chat is that if it was some sort of mixed system where you have uh, passive arrays and then active tracking data, you could actually disguise the active tracking data as recaptures and that would work. Um, that would probably work as a way to put it into RSP. The problem here is that there's only active tracking data and that would require some different, some changes to how the package works. Yeah, they how, how about the input, uh, how the yeah. input is, is getting hold of, yeah. Yeah, because then it yeah. can't come through Actel. Yeah. Yeah, it has to go straight to RSP. Maybe we can actually develop like uh, some way of converting the active tracking somewhat like an Actel output that is all yeah. valid. And we can then provide that as input for RSP. I think that might yeah. be the easiest way to go. But yeah. The problem uh, is actually, finding the time to do that coding. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so actually, uh, uh, if you could just email me, uh, so I have your contact, I'll, I'll put my email here. And then when I have some time in the future, we uh, I can get in touch and we can have a look at that if you're interested. Yeah, that sounds good. I'll send you an email with my info. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Thanks. No worries. And I think that was all I have from the chat. Um, if anyone has any more questions, both for RSP or Actel, um, just feel free. Yep. I'll get my camera back on. I didn't realize it was off, sorry. <laughs> You're hiding the shadows. Exactly. <laughs> it's jury time. I can relax. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, if there's no more questions, I think we are kind of done uh, for today. I will send an email to everyone uh, with the link as soon as Jan gives me some, some feedback on where that is posted. And uh, yeah, I think that's about it, isn't it?